Finter Woods. Written by an anonymous author. Performed by Jesse Cornett. Twelve years ago, I lived in a small town called Finter. It was a quiet place to grow up, with one school, a doctor's office, a police station, a couple of restaurants, and a host of local shops on the west side. We even had a theater, with films shown a month after the national release date. Over on the east side of town was the residential area, with about 40 houses, the town bar, and the woods that spanned an area of about 20 square miles. Although I'd grown up playing in Finter Woods, it was still easy to get lost in them. My father used to tell my friends and I to never go past the creek that ran through about a mile in from the road. Still, this gave us plenty of space to play, and we spent many summers building forts and playing hide-and-seek amongst the tall trees. One late summer evening, my friend Jess and I were out near the creek trying to sneak up on the rabbits that inhabited the woods, getting as close as we could before they'd notice and run away. I spent about ten minutes searching for one, and in my eagerness, I left Jess behind. She'd stopped to examine some oddly shaped rocks, and being impatient, I'd told her to catch up with me when she was finished. I just reached the hill where the creek bent and curved around to travel north for another three miles, when I spied a rabbit chewing on some leaves near an oak tree. I held my breath grabbing my jacket to stop it from flapping in the breeze, and began slowly inching toward it. I was careful to avoid stepping on any twigs. If one snapped underfoot, I'd be busted. And with the sun going down, it was likely the last chance I had at the game before I'd have to head home for dinner. The rabbit was blissfully unaware of my presence. Its brown coat was tinged orange by the setting sun and its ears flopped down like a hunter's hat. The irony didn't escape me as I crept up on it, silent as the leaves floating in the breeze. I smirked. I was just over three yards away from it, and it still hadn't noticed me. So far, so good. I slowed my pace even more. I didn't want to make a rookie mistake in my excitement and ruin the opportunity. The rabbit finished its leaf and casually began sniffing the next one before digging in. Less than seven feet away now, the closest I'd ever gotten. I felt my heart beat in my chest and, for a second, I was scared the rabbit would hear it thudding against my ribcage and dart off. I shook my head and continued up behind it. It was almost within arm's reach. I couldn't believe it. I stretched out my arm, fingers extended. Wait till Jess hears about this, I thought. I'd be the first kid in town to have touched a forest rabbit. My hand was about a foot from brushing its soft pelt. I could see each individual hair on its back, less than a foot away. I'd done it. I'd done it. Suddenly, an ear-splitting scream pierced the air, shattering the silence of the woods and sending the resting birds into a panic, scattering them from the trees. I gasped, and quick as a flash, the rabbit was under the brush and gone forever. I cursed aloud and spat. Damn it! Damn! Damn! <laughs> Frustration clouding my head. It was a good few seconds before I even stopped to consider where the scream had come from. Then, like a falling tree, it hit me. Jess. I sprinted back up the creek as fast as I could. She'd been about two hundred yards back when I'd last seen her near the old silver birches. It took me about two minutes to reach the pile of rocks where we had parted ways. My brow was covered in sweat and my hair was a mess where the wind had whipped through it. But all I could think about was finding Jess. 
even though I told myself that the woods were perfectly safe. I cursed myself for having left her alone. I spun around in a circle, scanning for any sign of her. But there was none. Jess! I yelled, my voice traveling through the woods and echoing off the trees. It was getting darker, and tall shadows were being cast all around me, like an unearthly net. Jess! Where are you? Call out to me, Jess! I stood and listened, but there was no reply. I was just about to run further up the creek to where the trail began, thinking that perhaps she had started to make her way back toward home. And then I saw it. It stood on the other side of the creek, about fifty yards away. It was as tall as the lowest branches of the sycamore, which I reckoned to be about seven feet off the ground. It was covered in black rags, ripped and torn across its thin, wiry body. A hood pulled tightly around its head obscured most of its features. Still, I could make out two white, pupilless eyes staring at me from the shadowed recess. I spied the flash of teeth, long, slender arms with hook-like fingers splaying out from stumped hands, almost dragged against the ground by its sides. I suddenly noticed an overpowering stench and wondered how I'd failed to notice it sooner. I'd smelt it before on the farms when the cattle were harvested in the slaughterhouses. It was the smell of death, thick and despairing. I almost choked, but my mouth wouldn't make a sound. I just kept staring at it, petrified, blood running cold through my veins. Even the birds stopped screeching in protest. Now there was nothing but silence. The creature and I stood on opposite sides of the creek, locked in a gaze that I'm certain I will remember until the day I die. I don't know how long I stood like that. It felt like minutes, but it was probably only a few seconds. Suddenly, it shifted its weight and hunched down. For a moment, I thought it was going to start running at me, and I almost threw up, uncontrollable fear racking my body. Then I realized that it had stooped to collect something from the ground. I cried out silently. It was Jess. Her limp body looked like a doll next to the creature's freakishly proportioned frame. Despite its thin and stick-like body, it easily picked her up with one bony hand, fingers clasped around her waist, teeth bared in a crooked, humorless smile. It opened up part of its shawl and pulled her close against its blackened torso. I caught glimpses of a ribcage and rotten flesh. I reached out my arm as if I could somehow pull her back to me, but in my heart... I knew it was too late. The creature turned and started to stride off, heading deeper into the forest. Even if I had known that area of the woods and had possessed the strength to move my legs, I never could have caught up to it. Before I knew it, the creature had disappeared from sight, as if it had never been there at all. Only the heavy smell of decay was left lingering in the air the only evidence that I hadn't just imagined the whole thing. I snapped my head around and began to run back towards town. It was a good mile away, and I'd never run that far before. But that day I ran and ran and didn't stop, jumping over fallen logs and ducking branches. I dared not look back. The darkness was nearly total by the time I burst from the undergrowth at the edge of town. I sprinted to the nearby bar and surged through the door, practically collapsing onto the floor. I don't really remember what happened next. From what I was told later on, it took everyone there about ten minutes to stop me from screaming about the demon I'd seen in the woods and that we had to find Jess. 
By the time they actually got the story out of me and organized a search party, two hours had passed. Jess's dad shook me and shouted at me, asking me over and over what had happened to his baby girl. I could only stare at him, dumbfounded and mute, until my own father dragged him off and told him to get a grip. The sheriff organized the townsfolk into two groups and assigned each group a section of the woods to search. I begged my father to stay, but he told me to calm down, that I was in shock and talking nonsense, my mind making up stories to try and make sense of what happened. He sent me home to rest under the watchful eye of my mother as he led one of the groups into the woods. Three hours passed. I lay in bed unable to sleep, huddled in my blankets, paranoid of every shadow and creak. I was convinced that it, the nightmare, was going to come back for me, the only witness to its abomination. Then I heard the front door open and the heavy footsteps of men entering the living room downstairs. I listened as they sat down and began to talk. Damnedest thing I ever seen in my life, Jerry. I don't know what's out there, but it sure riled up the dogs. I could tell that it was the sheriff speaking. What was it? A bear? Do you think, Sheriff? I didn't know who was speaking, but he sounded young. Maybe one of the farm hands. Maybe. All I know is that two of my best tracker hounds caught a scent and started going mad. They tore off into the woods faster than I've ever seen them run, and they didn't come back. Jesus, now we're down two dogs and a little girl. And then I heard my dad's voice. I eased up a little bit. Knowing he was back in the house made me feel safer. Chris said he found the poor girl's gloves down by the creek, right where my boy said they were playing. The unknown voice, presumably Chris, came again. It's true. They were covered in some kind of slime or something. Don't know what, but it smelled god-awful. One of the boys almost upped his liquor. Okay, well, at least we know she was there. I'm not hoping for much, but I'll pray. It's one big forest, and the chances of finding her are mighty slim. The sheriff sighed. I suppose I'd better go tell the family that they should prepare themselves for the worst. Damn, no man should have to outlive his kid in this brutal uncertainty. Didn't Travis say he saw something big moving through the forest? Asked another voice. The sheriff responded. Yeah, he radioed in. Said he saw some kind of, I don't know, giant moving in the distance. But he's liquored up, you know, and it's dark as the bottom of a well out there. He was probably just jumping at shadows. No, most likely a bear or a wolf or something jumped her from behind and, and dragged her off. My father spoke again now. Voice raised so everyone could hear. Okay, let's all go home. It's been a tough night. And there's not much more we can do in the dark. We'll search again tomorrow. Even if it's only a body we find, that's still better than our poor folks not knowing what happened. I want everyone to tell their kids not to go in the forest anymore till we know for certain what happened. Understood? There were murmurs of agreement followed by solemn goodbyes. The men left, and I heard the front door lock shut behind them. My father moved about the main floor for a few minutes before climbing the stairs and going to bed. Before he turned in, he poked his head into my room to check that I was okay. I pretended to be asleep. I had nothing to say. I didn't even know what to tell myself. But one thing I knew for certain... I hadn't been hallucinating. I'd really seen it. And whatever it was, it had Jess. I waited for half an hour after I heard my dad climb into his bed before I sat up 
and switched on my bedside light. I crept out of bed and got dressed as quietly as I could before descending the stairs. My father had taught me how to shoot and maintain a gun a few years back. It was important knowledge to have out in the country. Hunting was a tradition amongst the men, and when I was old enough, my father would take me camping in the woods to trap and shoot game like his father before him. I knew the spot in the garage where my dad kept his forty-four Magnum and rounds. After searching around for a few minutes, I found the key to the lockbox. I opened it, loaded the pistol, and grabbed a flashlight before leaving the house and locking the door behind me. The chilly nighttime air enveloped me and turned my breath to fog. I looked at the forest, once a place of fun and laughter, now dark and sinister in the moonlight. The twisted branches of its many trees stretching towards the sky like skeletal fingers. I swallowed my fear. That thing had Jess, and I intended to do everything I could to get her back. After all, it was my fault for leaving her alone out there. I ignored the lump in my throat and I walked determinedly down the road toward the woods. Don't worry, Jess, I thought. I'm coming. As I entered the woods, I immediately began to second-guess myself. I knew that what I was doing was not a sound decision by any definition, and I knew that my foolhardiness could very well get me killed. The thought of bumping into the creature out there, alone in the dark, was more terrifying than I can even describe. Knowing that Jess was in that exact situation herself drove me on. I trudged the familiar old trail for about twenty minutes until I came to the creek. I had never been there in the dark before. Although everything was where it should be, it looked different. Under cover of night, it was an alien place. The creature's domain. And I was an unwelcome stranger. I had no idea what lay beyond the creek, save for what I'd seen in the immediate area earlier that day. Carefully, I crossed the creek, the water soaking through my boots and dampening my trouser legs. As soon as I stepped over to the other side, I felt like I was lost. How could I get back? Which direction would I go? I ignored the first question. I had bigger things to worry about and decided to head off in the direction I'd last seen the creature going. I started walking, vigilant for any signs of movement or noise. I'd expected there to be animals out this late at night, but it was eerily silent. In my vulnerable state, every crackling footstep sounded to me like an alarm, alerting the creature to my presence. I stopped for a moment and looked around with my flashlight. I felt like the darkness was swallowing me. That the thing must be sitting just outside the borders of my light, laughing at my efforts to find it. I realized that if there was anything out there, the light would only serve to give away my position, effectively negating any kind of advantage I might have. After a pause, I switched off the flashlight and waited for my eyes to adjust. It was difficult at first, but after a few minutes, I could make out enough of the forest to slowly make my way through. About ten minutes passed before I heard it. A short, sharp yelp to my left, somewhere in the distance. I paused and waited, listening intently for any other noise. A moment later, a snap echoed through the forest, followed by a dull thump. I was not alone anymore. I crouched down and slowly made my way towards the noise. My experiencing sneaking up on rabbits proved essential as I crept stealthily through the dark, distributing my weight carefully so as to remain quiet. After a while, 
I reached a clearing where the trees parted to reveal a grassy patch about half the size of a football field. In the center of the clearing was a rocky depression that sunk down into the earth. I was about to make my way over and investigate when the creature reappeared. It was near the edge of the clearing to the south and was slowly limping its way over to the depression, dragging something behind it. In the darkness, I couldn't make out what it was pulling, but it appeared to be the size of a child and it had been snapped in the middle. My stomach turned as I watched the creature's conquest flap limply with the bounce of each step it took. Tears stung my eyes. I swallowed hard. Sorrow and fear swirled within me, impossibly entangled. I prayed to God to not let it be Jess and continued to watch as the thing reached the pit and hurled the object it carried over the rim. It hit the ground with the unmistakable sound of crunching bone. The creature bent down head first as if to crawl down the rocks, and then it stopped. Slowly, it stood back up and sniffed. I instinctively pressed my back to a tree, removing myself from view and strained to listen. I heard it sniff again softly and walk around in what sounded like a small circle, and then nothing. I waited for what seemed like eternity. I waited. I was unbearably tense expecting to see its milky eyes slowly peer round the side of the tree at any second, or to feel a long, hooked finger slide out of the darkness and fall on my shoulder. But nothing happened immediately. Several minutes later, I was still waiting. Gathering my courage, I hesitantly glanced around the trunk, only to see that the clearing was empty. I double triple and quadruple checked the area, sweeping my eyes across every inch of the terrain, making deadly sure the creature was gone. Only then did I step back out to the edge of the clearing, keeping low to the ground. Stepping into the center of an open area was out of the question, suicidal even. What if it was only hiding near the outskirts of the clearing or waiting in the rocky fissure at the center? The notion went against every survival instinct I had, and yet I had to know. I had come looking for Jess. If I turned back without checking to see whether it was her, crumpled and broken at the bottom of those rocks, I might never know. The sheriff was right. Not knowing was the worst part. Before I stepped out, I pulled the gun out of my waistband and cocked the hammer back, being careful to mute the click by smothering it between my legs. When it was loaded and ready to fire, I began to slowly inch my way away from the safety of the tree line out into the open. I took a few steps and stopped, waiting to see if anything came crashing towards me. When nothing did, I continued my cautious journey into the depression. When I reached the lip, I aimed the gun ahead of me, steeled myself, and slowly looked over. It was about ten feet to the bottom, and its circumference was a little larger than I had expected. One side of the hole was hollow and extended into the ground as a sort of cave, large enough to drive a car through. At the mouth of the cave was the body, slumped over a jagged rock. I glanced around again to ensure nothing was creeping up on me and then began to lower myself down. I would just need a quick glance to make sure it wasn't, or God forbid was, Jess. And then I'd leave and run back to Fenter. I'd wake my dad and the others and lead them to the cave. And then we'd kill it. At that moment, it occurred to me that the thing might still be in the cave, watching and waiting. 
perhaps it watched me struggle down the rock. But if it was in the cave, I reasoned there was nothing I could do about it. I must be crazy, I thought to myself. I was so afraid that I couldn't feel anything anymore. I continued my descent and remained on high alert, watching for any sign of the creature. No sooner did I confirm that it was in fact gone when I promptly slipped and fell off the side of the rock, landing awkwardly and sending pain shooting through my ankle. I nearly cursed aloud but bit down on my lip and shouted silently in my head. Luckily, a quick self-assessment confirmed that nothing was broken or sprained, just aching. I was able to walk on it without a problem. Thank goodness. The last thing I needed was a broken foot. My thoughts had been so preoccupied with the sudden pain that I had momentarily forgotten where I was. Right next to the cadaver. My leg bumped against it and I spun around, gun at the ready, almost firing it off into the rocks. I quickly berated myself from my itchy trigger finger and looked down. Relief and repulsion washed over me. I could see clearly that it wasn't Jess. In fact, it wasn't even human. Rather, it was the remains of a large dog. One of the sheriff's hounds that had gone missing earlier. Its back was snapped in two and folded in on itself. Its snout was crumbled back into its face, turning it into a flat, tooth-filled gap. Blood, fur, bone, and brain were splattered over it, and one eye hung loosely from its socket. I felt like it was staring right at me. I looked away and felt bile rising in my throat. The smell of death and decay near the cave was overpowering. I dreaded to think about who or what else might be nestled inside. I was about to begin scrambling back up the edge of the depression when I heard a sob. I spun around and stared into the darkness of the cave. It sounded faint, as if it had come from a long way away, echoing through narrow rock passages until it eventually succeeded in finding its way to the surface. It came again. Having heard it twice, there was no mistaking it. It was the sound of a child crying. The first thoughts rushing through my head were ones of joy. She was alive. It had to be Jess, hidden away deep in the creature's lair. No sooner had the thought crossed my mind when I realized, with a fear unlike any I had ever known, that I would have to go into the cave to get her. I had no choice. I couldn't turn back. Living with the guilt would be far worse than anything that might befall me if I entered the cave. Readying my gun, I pulled out the flashlight and switched it on. The beam stung my eyes for a few seconds as they adjusted to the sudden change in brightness. But I could soon see that the cave went on for a few yards before widening into a large rocky chamber with passages of varying sizes leading further underground. I entered the mouth of the cave and shone the light over the walls and floor. The beam danced over bones scattered across the ground. It looked as if every type of animal in the forest had eventually wound up in the creature's lair, torn apart and stripped of flesh. I covered my mouth and nose with the sleeve of my gun hand and continued to walk. I saw four passages. The sobbing appeared to be coming from the one furthest to my left. Thankfully, it was one of the wider passages, and I found I could comfortably walk through it with enough room to stand up straight. I struggled to suppress the impulse to run and hide while I still had a chance to save myself. I realized that if the creature came from the mouth of the cave then and there, I would be trapped. If it was already in the cave, I was walking straight into its spindly, disproportionate arms. 
I swallowed hard and continued to walk. After a couple of yards, the tunnel turned right sharply and opened up into a small version of the chamber from which I had just come. I had stumbled upon a bizarre museum of personal trinkets. Watches, jewelry, passports, letters, glasses, clothes, books, wallets, countless things with unspoken sentimental value. I picked up one of the passports and opened it. Paul Ashcroft, born 1972, Heronford, Ohio. Another read Richard Blunt, born 1954, Westville, California. I shone the light over the letters, noting that the addresses were from places all over the country. Then it dawned on me. I finally understood. It all made sense. The reason I had never seen this thing in the woods before was because it had only recently arrived. It must have traveled from place to place, from forest to national park to desert to mountain, picking people off, taking their effects, before it moved on to the next town. It was like a sick scavenger hunt, the way it killed people and kept their belongings as souvenirs. Another sob brought me back to reality and I dropped the passport to the ground. I hurriedly moved to the back of the chamber and found another short passage. This opened into a medium-sized cavern, inside of which I saw Jess, sitting on the floor crying. She looked up and shielded her eyes when my light shone over her. Please, please let me go. She sobbed, tears streaming down her pale cheeks. I stood a moment dumbfounded, as I realized that I had been so focused on finding Jess that I hadn't planned an escape. I didn't know quite what to do. Thinking quickly, I decided I had better let her know it was me before deciding on anything. I shone the light upwards, illuminating my face as I moved toward her. Jess stopped sobbing and stared. Jess! I whispered and knelt beside her. I've come to rescue you, but we don't have much time. We need to go now before that thing comes back. She remained motionless for a moment and then threw her arms around me, her body shaking. I thought I was going to die down here. I thought it was going to eat me like it did the rest. I just, I don't, it's... She trailed off, unable to get her words out through the tears. I squeezed her back for a moment and then went to lift her. The sudden sound of metal clanging against rock reverberated through the cave. I shone the light down and my heart sank. She was chained to a heavy metal ring pin that had been nailed deep into the rocks beside her. I couldn't escape. <laughs> she sniffed. I tried to pull it out, but it's no use. I stood for a second, dejected. I could go and get help. Come back. No! She squeaked. Please don't leave me here. Panic spread across her face, and in that moment I knew all I could do was promise not to leave. I thought for a few moments and then, realizing my only option, took her chin and looked her in the eye. Jess. I have a gun. I'm going to have to shoot the chain to set you free. It's going to be very loud, and the noise will probably attract the thing here. She said nothing, but looked at me, waiting for me to continue. As soon as it's broken, I went on. We're going to have to run for the cave entrance and back through the woods. She looked thoughtful for a moment and then took my chin and nodded, and then she kissed me. I blushed. Here we were, sitting below ground in a monster's cave, and I was blushing. I almost laughed and smiled back at her. I took a moment to regain my composure and then aimed my gun at the chain. 
Cover your ears, okay? I'll do it on three. One. Two. A guttural moan sounded from the mouth of the cave and echoed down the passage as to where we were. I looked at Jess just in time to see the color drain from her face and felt it drain from my own. It was back! Without thinking, I pulled the trigger. The gun cracked. It sound deafening in such a small place, and the chain shattered. I grabbed Jess before she could react and pulled her up, sprinting towards the makeshift museum behind us. As we entered the chamber, I dove behind a table full of bric-a-brac and pulled her down with me. No sooner had we landed on the floor than I saw the creature enter the room and scramble over to the passage from which we had come. As soon as it was gone from sight, I pulled Jess back to her feet and pushed her in the direction of the entrance to the cave. She didn't need any convincing. Together we ran as fast as our legs could carry us. As the mouth of the cave came into view, a rage-filled scream rang out behind us as the creature discovered its meal was gone. As Jess and I reached our exit point, I could hear wood splintering and the crash of dozens of tiny objects hitting stones as the beast tore through the museum after us. I grabbed Jess's foot and hoisted her up so that she could grab the lip of the fissure and pull herself into the clearing. I spun around and then saw it exit the passage into the main chamber. Its hood had fallen down to expose its inhuman face. I fired a shot in its direction and it screeched in agony as the bullet connected with its upper leg, knocking it back for a second. Taking advantage of the spare moment, I spun back around, leapt for the edge, and grabbed hold. Jess seized me by the collar and helped pull me up just as hooked fingers brushed the bottom of my shoe. We started to run across the clearing and realized it was morning. In the east, the sun peeked over the horizon, casting a slight glow over the woods and turning the sky a pinkish red. We ran for miles. For hours. The whole while, I could hear Jess's captor crashing through the trees after us. If my bullet hadn't connected, I doubt we would have stood a chance of outrunning it. But somehow, whether by luck or fate, we survived. We reached the creek 45 minutes later. By the time we saw the edge of the woods, we had run, fueled by adrenaline, for over an hour. When we reached Finter, I fired the gun into the air and collapsed, shaking violently. Within a couple of minutes, a crowd of alarmed townspeople had surrounded us, some asking what had happened, others grabbing and hugging Jess, and most just staring blankly in confusion at the commotion. When Jess's father arrived, he broke down and cried, holding his daughter to his chest and thanking God and me equally for her safe return. When my father arrived, he took the gun from me, put his hand on my shoulder and gave me a look. It was a look that said he didn't care what had happened. He was just glad I was home and in one piece. We gave a statement to the sheriff. Afterwards, a group was organized and armed. I was asked to lead my dad, the sheriff, and roughly twenty other men to the cave. I was tired and reluctant to go back, but the light of day made me braver, and there, beside my dad, I felt safe. After a couple of hours, we came across the clearing and found the cave system just as Jess and I had described. The museum was empty. We found the shattered chain untouched where we had left it. A brief examination of the other caves revealed skeletons. Later, identified as other missing persons from the towns that bordered Fenter. Forensics later proved that the victims had been dead for some time. We searched the woods until sunset, but found no sign of the creature or which way it might have gone. That night, as I looked out my window before going to sleep, I saw it again, standing at the edge of the woods. 
It looked at me through my window for a while. I stared back, just like during our first encounter. Then it turned and walked back into the woods. I never saw the creature again. I figured it moved on to another place, away from Finter. The townsfolk searched for another week, but no further traces of the creature were found. Official reports say that people had been kidnapped, most of them killed, by a maniac, who then invaded capture and escaped into the wilderness. But off the record, the people of Finter believed Jess. They believed me. These days, the events are a distant memory. Everyone has moved on. Jess attended an out-of-state college and graduated with honors and is now an animal rights lawyer. I relocated some 30 miles from Venter and got into farming. Then I met someone and got married and raised a family. But I'll never forget what happened to Jess and I in Finter Woods. Whenever I go camping or hiking or set foot on a trail, I'm reminded it's still out there. Who knows? It might just be in your town by now. Thanks for listening. The story you've just heard in this channel are fan-funded. Visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com today to become a patron and help us bring radio theater back from the dead. Just click support us. Choose an amount you're comfortable with and become a part of our family today. Just $2 per month gets you immediate access to our patrons area. There, you'll find advanced new releases, our incredible archive of over 300 hours of productions, plus never-before-heard bonus material. Best of all, it's totally ad-free and in HD MP3 format. You get insider updates from our production team, the secret stash of streaming downloadable HD indie films, and you get to experience our patrons only one-on-one -on -one live events, putting you up close and personal with your favorite performers, unscripted and unrehearsed. All of this and more is yours today. And all you have to do is choose your level of support. Go to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com now and join us as we turn off the lights and turn on the dark.